Thank you everybody for coming. I'd like to go ahead and get started so we can keep our uh, session on time. My name is Melanie Cree Green. I'm from the University of Colorado and Elizabeth Parks will be joining us shortly. And we're the moderators for this session of new methods and models to study human metabolism with stable isotope tracers. And just to let people know, this is a AFMR sponsored um, symposia here. And the mission of AFMR is to develop and mentor tomorrow's leaders in medical research from bench to bedside to practice. And uh, just as a little bit of history, AFMR was actually founded in 1940 by Dr. Henry Christensen. And it has consistently been an organization that has offered young researchers the opportunity to present their findings to peers and also to um, receive the guidance of senior scientists. And the approach to uh, AFMR-based research is multidisciplinary and translational. And in 1996, it was uh, renamed AFMR and has been associated with FASAB for more than 20 years. And so currently, AFMR has four regional meetings that are held between January and April. These are great opportunities to have students um, present their work. They have many oral sessions for students. And then AFMR participates in two national meetings, Translational Science and then here at FASEB. Uh, AFMR has two publications, one of them the Journal of Investigational Medicine. Um, and of note, today's symposia will be published in uh, GYM later this year. Uh, so you can look out for that. And then um, the Journal of Investigation uh, High Impact Case Reports. And AFMR has been very involved in public policy. Uh, the two um, kind of biggest achievements for AFMR were significant roles in getting the Mentored Clinical Scientist Research Development Awards, KO8s and K23s uh, program funded, and then also with the Clinical Research Enhancement Act for uh, NIH Loan Repayment Program. And currently, AFMR is aligned with Research America and FASEB for continued public policy efforts to fund research. So a little bit about background of stable isotope tracers at FASEB. Um, stable isotope tracers have been presented at FASEB since at least the 1960s. And um, almost every year, there has been a consistent tracer focus, ranging from symposia like this, um, evening industry-sponsored symposia um, to uh, separate meeting tracts. But despite this 60-year history of this methodology, um, we still have so many questions in physiology that are still to be posed. And so the field continues to move forward in terms of needing new methodologies and new ways to interpret the data uh, that we're collecting. And so with that, we're going to have a very diverse group of talks today. Um, with different ways of um, using stable isotopes uh, for different uh, physiologic measures. So the first talk will be Advances in Isotope Models for Understanding Protein Metabolism um, by Dr. Robert Wolf from uh, UAMS, and you may recognize his name from the Stable Isotope Tracer textbook. Our second talk will be Use of an Oral Glycerol Drink Combined with Isotope Analysis to Understand Hepatic Metabolism. This talk is going to be um, discussing use of um, uh, magnets for isotopomers rather than the traditional LCMSMS. And then our last talk will be adapting oral glucose tolerance tests with tracers to different patient populations. And here we're going to delve a little bit into mathematical modeling, which is also required to help us understand some more uh, complex tracer challenges. And um, if you could please, we'll have a couple questions at the end of each session about five, or at the end of each speaker for about five minutes, and then we can do more questions um, at, the end of the, at the end of the session. And so with that, I will have uh, Dr. Robert Wolf come up. <laughs> 
Russia, Russia, okay, go away, go away, go away. <laughs> okay, kind of a shaky start, but <laughs> let's hope things pick up from here. I think we want to, okay. Okay, uh, usually a uh, perfunctory thanks for being included, but when I heard in the introduction that this uh, uh, AFCR is particularly to promote the development of young investigators. I really am happy to be included in the uh, group of speakers. Um, I changed the title a little bit because I actually didn't have the title of the uh, symposium at hand when I prepared the talk. And I, um, as you'll see, uh, we're not really going to focus in this talk on a uh, new method. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, whole body protein turnover, which is the main topic, uh, this study I was able to find from 1939. So. So it's certainly in a liberal interpretation of new methods to, uh, to, to say I'm going to focus on this whole body protein turnover. But, uh, but I think it's an interesting uh, circumstance for a few reasons. Um, the uh, most important being, if you're doing this kind of methodology, that there are considerations, although the methods have been around for 70 years, that have not really been appreciated. And I think that uh, there's been a new interest, particularly as we talk about translating research into clinically relevant um, approaches that the whole body protein turnover studies still really have a place because uh, for one thing, we know when we're talking about the m measuring the response of, to nutrient intake that it's at the whole body level. The whole body eats it, so uh, looking at the whole body protein turnover has relevance. And uh, there's certainly been much more of a focus on muscle than any other aspect, but muscle constitutes less than half of whole body protein metabolism. So uh, when we focus just on the muscle, uh, we are missing things. And, and using the whole body protein approaches, of course, doesn't preclude the use of the simultaneously of measurement of response in muscle. Um, and that's the third point here. And the fourth point being that, uh, that, and this is really, I think, becoming much more recently appreciated, that both protein synthesis and, and breakdown are measured and that a lot of the uh, anabolic uh, responses to intake is the result of changes in protein breakdown rather than protein synthesis, which is, of course, uh, missed by most traditional approaches. Well, the whole body protein, uh, I'm going to uh, use this because the, uh, this mouse isn't working. I'm going to. I don't know why it's not moving. I thought we had gotten this straightened out, but um, you know the thing is, there's no, there's no. Yeah, we we got no. Uh, yeah, by Bernstein, no. Okay, now it's working its way up. That should yeah. work. Okay. So here's the slide I was talking about when I said that there's nothing new about whole body protein turnover and the points I made about uh, why we're still interested in a method that's been around for so long. Well, the model that I'm going to talk about and that's really most widely used involves uh, use of essential amino acids as a tracer. And the point is, in the fasting state, since essential amino acids and uh, leucine and phenylalanine would be the most commonly used uh, example, but it could be done with any essential amino acid, the only source of amino acids coming into, of that amino acid coming into the amino acid pool is from protein breakdown. So by the traditional tracer dilution method, we're able to quantify the rate of protein breakdown, 
If we also are able to measure its oxidation, in the case of leucine, it's actually oxidation. In the case of phenylalanine, we use the uh, rate of hydroxylation to tyrosine. But irreversible loss of amino acids, then the rate of synthesis can be calculated as the rate of breakdown minus the rate of oxidation. And uh, this, this works out just fine in the fasted state. The problem becomes a little more complicated when we get into the postprandial state, which as we start to really look at how nutrients are handled in the body, obviously we need to focus on the postprandial state, in which case now the tracer measures total appearance of amino acids. That is not only coming from breakdown, but also from exogenous RA. The amount of, uh, let's say if we're using leucine as a tracer, the amount of leucine that's coming into the amino acid pool from the uh, protein, dietary protein in addition to this. So that we have to be able to quantify how much the exogenous contribution is to the total RA so that we can calculate endogenous RA, which is equal to breakdown. And then from that, we can calculate the rate of synthesis. Well, <laughs> there have been different approaches, but certainly this, the, the, the most elegant and, and simplest approach it's called the intrinsically labeled protein model, which was first described in the 90s, but has been used many times in a variety of formats since then. The general idea is that we label the exogenous protein or the dietary protein with the same amino acid that you're using as the tracer, but a different label on it, so that we can quantify through the tracer appearance in the peripheral pool what the actual absorption or contribution of the exogenous RA is to the total RA. Um, <laughs> the protein can be produced by, for example, feeding labeled amino acids to cows and using the milk that's produced from the cow that's labeled intrinsically with uh, the protein or, or growing chickens on a C13 uh, amino acid substrate and isolating the eggs. Um, so a variety of approaches, but, but in fact, this has become considered the gold standard. In fact, what motivated me to uh, start looking at this method in a little more detail was the fact that uh, we had a paper recently rejected because we didn't use this labeled endogenous approach. So uh, uh, that was, was a tangible sort of motivation to take a closer look at this intrinsically labeled protein approach and see if it really is as simple and elegant as it would seem from this uh, uh, schematic here. Once the, uh, uh, we, I'm, I'm just gonna show this real briefly and, and there are a few things I'm gonna skip over but just to point out that to calculate the total RA, we use the Steele equation, which again, nothing new, it's described in the 50s. Uh, but the important point is that, we, that the uh, way that intrinsically labeled protein pool is uh, quantified in, a turnover is quantified in the uh, <coughs> case of uh, the exogenous RA, is that you actually use this component, which is the total RA times the enrichment in the blood coming from the uh, uh, PO or the ingested uh, protein. So that instead of actually having a traditional application of the Tristeel equation, the appearance is, the appearance of label is actually an unknown in the equation. And we'll talk a little bit about this specifically, uh, the problems that it brings up uh, in a little bit. But first I'd like to just go through some of the major problem, major assumptions. And, and those of you that aren't doing protein metabolism, please try to just think in broader terms because these same issues, I can tell you, come up over and over in a variety of tracer methods. And so that uh, you really need to think about the ways in which the tracer can give you an erroneous result because to sort of spoil the, the uh, end point here, that's the, the, the answer here is that the intrinsically labeled protein, in fact, doesn't give you a good measure of the exogenous RA. Well, uh, why not? That means that some of the major assumptions, some or all of the major assumptions must be wrong. What are the assumptions? First, that when you ingest a labeled a protein, that, the, that what's absorbed is actually the enrichment that you, that you ate and were able to measure. But in fact, uh, we have to assume then that there's no dilution of the ingested label prior to the measurement of the peripheral blood. Secondly, we have to, uh, 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 consider the measurement of the label from intrinsically labeled protein in the non-steady state and that there's no recycling of tracer and that the volume of distribution can be reasonably approximated by a single value. So I'm not going to go into detail on all of these points. Some of them have been really hashed over before. But I am going to point out uh, 
uh, start with this issue of the dilution of the intrinsically labeled protein in the GI tract because the GI tract is continually losing uh, protein and amino acids. And in particular, when you eat a, a protein meal, then there's digestive enzymes that are secreted into the intestines, and those protein are also digested. Those amino acids become contributing to the total amount of amino acids that are absorbed. And of course, they're not labeled. They're coming from endogenous proteins. So what we uh, just, uh, I'm going to skip over the der derivative of where these numbers come from, but we know from the model that's published in that paper there that, that this uh, uh, unlabeled source of amino acids into the GI tract dilutes the, uh, la the, un the labeled amino acid that's ingested in the intrinsically labeled protein. So if we just uh, look at specific numbers, and now I'm not going to go through all this derivation, but just take my word for it from the papers that we calculate that this is the rate of appearance of leucine, the rate of absorption of leucine from the digestive endo of endogenous protein. So these are unlabeled amino acids. If we look at 20 grams of, of uh, whey protein ingested and we account for the digestibility, uh, we end up with uh, a total of 0 0.0, and, and that the enrichment is 0.05, tracer tracy ratio, then we have an appearance of, a total appearance of this amount this amount is the amount of labeled leucine in the protein, and this is the amount of labeled leucine in the uh, unlabeled leucine. So if we put it together, what does all this mean? Well, what it means, if we take average values for secretion of protein into the GIT and consider that in the context of a 20-gram dose, it's a pretty big amount. So that the total amount of protein that we, uh, of leucine that we're getting is 2.1 grams, out of that, a significant amount, 0.6 grams, is the unlabeled endogenous. So what does that do to our enrichment? The labeled isn't affected by the absorption of the uh, endogenous, so that we look at the tracer-tracy ratio, and it's 0.038. We started with a value of 0.05, so it's a 24% dilution. Of course, this is an approximation. We don't know exactly what it is, but the basic point is that we know that the magnitude of secretion of unlabeled amino acid into the GIT is in the same ballpark as the amount of dietary protein that's eaten. So we know from this that the tracer uh, intrinsically labeled protein is diluted in the GIT. And uh, what this means is, if you remember, the reason I showed those equations is just to highlight the key point of why does it make a difference. And that is that the presumed enrichment of the protein in the calculation of exogenous RA is the measured value at the point at which you eat it. But what we're seeing is that the actual value that's absorbed is not 0.05, but a 24% dilution of that. So um, what this means is that if we take that in the context of how do we calculate endogenous RA, which is equivalent to protein breakdown, that if we, that an underestimation of the exogenous RA from the intrinsically labeled protein approach will cause an overestimation of the rate of breakdown. This is not encouraging. Well, I, I, this will help keep me, uh, get me back on time. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom line is, so what does this mean? And the, the data that the blank slides there represented uh, calculating the rate of uh, exogenous RA with the, with the assumed value of 0.05 versus the uh, accounting for the dilution, tracer dilution and showing that you have different rates of protein breakdown calculated. And in fact, what it shows from the results is that if you eat 20 grams of protein and use the intrinsically labeled protein method, you conclude that there is no suppression of protein breakdown. If you account for the dilution, then in fact you get a significant uh, rate of uh, suppression, uh, suppression of the rate of protein breakdown. If we look at other approaches where we've looked at both whole body as well as across the forearm uh, and, and measured with an independent method whether amino acids, essential amino acids, actually suppress protein breakdown, we see that a variety of studies show that in fact uh, the, and, and the intake of essential amino acids has a suppressive effect on whole body as well as muscle protein breakdown. So that 
the conclusion using the intrinsically labeled protein method is, is physiologically incorrect, that it concludes that there's really, that the rate of uh, protein breakdown doesn't change, therefore it's not really playing a role in the anabolic response to the dietary protein, where in fact it's playing a major role, and in fact what we find is really a larger role than the simulation of protein synthesis. Now another uh, uh, potential area where the tracer can be diluted is across the splanchnic bed, and this is a problem that comes up over and over in tracer studies where incorporation is measured. Uh, so it really has a it has a uh, um, application far beyond this particular example. The basic point is we'll assume a situation. Obviously, this is just a schematic, but a situation where protein synthesis and protein breakdown are going on continuously in the liver. Uh, but there's no net difference between the two. So the amount of amino acids taken up by the protein is equal to the amount that are released. However, if we consider, let's say, an enrichment, a tracer tracer ratio of, of uh, 0.25, meaning that one out of every five of the, uh, of the uh, uh, molecules of tracer that enters the uh, portal vein here is uh, labeled, the uptake of label into the liver is going to be proportional to what it is in the blood coming in. But, but, but what leaves the protein pool is going to be reflective of what the protein pool is. And when, you, when we first start the tracer intake, there's no label here. So that you're going to have uptake of label, but you're going to have no release of label, with the result that there's no net change in the amount of, uh, of tracer or tracee that's come in, and there's no amount no difference in the amount of tracy from what's come into the liver and what's leaving, and yet you've had a 33% reduction in the actual amount of tracer that's leaving, and therefore another dilution of the uh, tracer enrichment. Now, of course, over time, the protein pool becomes more and more labeled, and this will ultimately, at a plateau value, what comes out will equal what goes in, so that we can't give you a precise amount of uh, how much the uh, how much of dilution occurs this way, but it's certainly a significant uh, site of contribution as well. We know then from this that in a general sense, protein turnover in the splanchnic tissue and organs can dilute uh, the, intrinsic, the enrichment of, uh, uh, of uh, the intrinsic labeled protein. And uh, again, it's the same as with the dilution from the gut, and that is that if it's diluted, it will overestimate the rate of protein breakdown and be contribute to why we have had such a uh, uh, number of papers that have concluded that amino acids and protein don't suppress protein breakdown, which are really just a methodological, uh, the result of the methodology rather than the physiology. Now the final point I want to hit on is the issue of how it's calculated, how the appearance is calculated. because. Of course, when you eat it, even in eating as a bolus, that comes in over a period of a couple of hours so that there's a non-steady state. And, and as I said, the equation, the seal equation, is rearranged to actually measure the rate of appearance of the label as the unknown, rather than in the case where the seal equation was actually derived, this, the uh, tracer infusion is the known variable. In this case, it's the unknown variable. And we have to assume in this case, that there's no recycling, so that whatever we measure in the blood, it's just the result of what's been absorbed, not that it's been recycled around the body. But we know that that's not true, that it's not possible. The point is here that this is, a, this is, the, uh, this is the term that we're measuring, namely the appearance of the uh, uh, isotope coming from the intrinsically labeled protein, and it's a variable over time. So we just are taking, if we even take the point of taking the total area under the curve, we still are overestimating what that appearance is because of the fact that there is recycling of the tracer. And the most obvious uh, example of that is the, is, is the injection, the response to the injection in plasma leucine of labeled and unlabeled leucine together, which is used in the flooding dose technique. And what we see is that the, um, the appearance is a bolus, intravenous, and it occurs before this first sample is taken. And yet even two hours after that appearance uh, has stopped, 
because the infusion is just a bolus. There's no more coming in, and yet we still have enrichment in the plasma 50% of what we started with two hours later. And the reason is because there's recycling of the label. So that as we try to measure or quantify the rate of appearance of the intrinsically labeled protein, then it's uh, recycling. What you're measuring at any time, any point in time is what's just been absorbed as well as what's recirculated that hasn't been cleared completely uh, in the previous pass of the uh, uh, tr uh, tracy across the active tissues. So another source of error, and all three of these sources of errors, the important thing to recognize is this isn't just random uh, effects. That, in fact, this error of recirculation works in the opposite direction of the other two, and that's why you get kind of ballpark uh, reasonable answers with the methodology because you have certain assumptions, namely related to the dilution of the tracer, that, that uh, cause an overestimation of the, an underestimation of the exogenous RA, overestimation of, of the uh, uh, rate of breakdown. In this case, we're overestimating the uh, appearance of uh, tracer because we're double counting molecules as they've, uh, as they've first appeared and then recir recirculated. And then uh, uh, as a result, we're overestimating the exogenous RA and underestimating the endogenous. So we have three major sources of errors. Two, one tends to cancel out the other two, but that really doesn't help in terms of uh, valid conclusions. So what's the alternative? And, and uh, you know, as uh, Melanie was referring to the uh, tracer uh, history of the, of the EB, and for at least 15 years I was the organizer of the tracer methodology group. So going back to the 1970s, I have always loved tracers, but the thing that's interesting is sometimes it's just not the best way to, to skin the cat because uh, what, what we find is the alternative to the uh, uh, endogenous, uh, the intrinsically labeled protein, we can call the bioavailability approach, which is much more simple, but we know the amount of protein we've eaten and we know the true yield of digestibility. Uh, almost all the proteins have, that, that's been experimentally determined and it's ranged. What this refers to is how much of the protein you've eaten, uh, the amino acid tracy and the protein you've eaten is actually absorbed in the form that you've eaten it in. And for high quality proteins, that's not very, very, very uh, variable. It's in the range of 90 to 100%, but these values are available. And then in the case of the, uh, but, but what you still have to account for is the fact that when you eat it and it passes through the splanchnic bed, there's still uh, some of that tracy is going to be cleared by the splanchnic bed before it ever gets to the periphery. But we know in the case of phenylalanine exactly what that is because phenylalanine is only cleared in the body and the liver. So that we measure the rate of phenylalanine, phenylalanine hydroxylation, this is in fact the fraction of amount of phenylalanine passing the liver that's taken up and irreversibly uh, hydroxylated, meaning that it's a direct measure of the total clearance. We don't have to worry about protein turnover because if there's no net difference between synthesis and breakdown, there's not going to be, there's not going to be any net uptake of the their change in bioavailability where it is a big problem in terms of the uh, intrinsically labeled. The same thing with your bioavailability of the ingested amino acid, it's diluted by unlabeled, but we're measuring unlabeled anyway, so it doesn't uh, have an impact as well. So that, so that it's a circumstance where really that uh, due to the, the inherent uh, problems of labeling, uh, of, of using an intrinsically labeled protein, that we're actually much better off and much more accurately off by uh, using just the uh, uh, calculated bioavailability. Parenthetically, which was what my point was in the paper that was rejected, uh, and it goes to show that when you reject a paper based on a, your favorite method, you have to prepare for the fact that the person who gets rejected may look at that method a little more closely. So you live and learn. Um, Anyway, to, to wrap things up, I'll just summarize by saying that this intrinsically labeled protein uh, is, is, well, considered to be the gold standard. In fact, the fundamental assumptions underlying its use are pretty much all violated. Uh, they, uh, the intrinsically labeled protein is diluted in the GAT and across the splanchnic bed, 
resulting in overestimation of exogenous RA. The overestimation of exogenous RA underestimates the suppression of protein breakdown, so that we've had really some incorrect concepts for the last 20 years as to how dietary protein uh, modulates the anabolic response in humans. And thirdly, that this recycling of tracer may, uh, may counter the effect of the dilution of tracer to some extent, but it's unknown how much that is, so that really it's, uh, uh, you come up with somewhat reasonable values, but only because of canceling errors. And uh, so the final, um, by comparison, the ex use of the bioavailability approach is a we have a direct measure of the only real source of loss of the phenylalanine. And uh, as a result, of course, there's always error in measurement, but the error isn't systematic. There's no over or underestimation. The error is just a random error related to measurement. So from all this, I conclude that the exogenous RA from ingested protein is better estimated by the bioavailability approach than by the intrinsically labeled protein approach. I don't know if I made up for our shaky start on our time, but I, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. We can take a couple questions if you'd like to come up to the microphone, please. I can tell there's probably nobody in the audience that's used this method because uh, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, uh, yeah, we're definitely uh, prepared for whatever attack I could uh, receive. But. So would you suggest people go back and recalculate their data with this alternative approach to yeah, see? Yeah, I, mean, I think we, we've actually, there, there are a few of the papers really, and in fairness to the, to the originators of this method, they provided all the data in their paper to recalculate, which we've done. And uh, as I said, it, it, it gives you complete, I mean, it's a little bit hard because we don't know the magnitude of the errors, but the fundamental, there's, there are a couple of fundamental issues that have come from this, that when the recalculation, one is that the speed of digestion affects the rate of protein synthesis. And that's, a, that's also, I haven't gone into that, but that's, that's also a result of this when you recalculate the data, making approximations for the uh, assumptions that you don't get that conclusion. And the second, the most important being that no matter how you do it with this method, you conclude the protein breakdown doesn't play a role. But when you recalculate it with the bioavailability approach and all of their other data, then it shows just a significant drop in, in uh, protein breakdown. So it's really a fundamental basis for, you know, if we think about how much research has been done on protein synthesis and how little has been done on breakdown, and yet when this method is used, you find that, uh, that the magnitude of effect of protein breakdown far exceeds the effect of protein synthesis. How do you deal with a lot of the uh, amino acids coming in as peptides into the circulation? Well, they're not, they, they, uh, um, that's why the term true ileodigestibility. So that uh, uh, if it, the question is how do you deal with peptides? And if they're coming in as peptides, they're not coming in in the, in the, as in the Tracy format. So they are, not, they are excluded. That's part of the uh, equation for the, uh, uh, for the calculation of true ileodigestibility. They exclude anything that's not in the format. Now, of course, they could ultimately be converted into uh, amino acids in the body. So, uh, you know, that would be a potential source. But if you look at the, uh, the you know, the, the uh, uh, you probably could account for it if, if, if you uh, had the, uh, in the animal experiments, the way they did the true ileal digestibility is taking samples from the end of the ileum. And uh, so you m well might be able to make assumptions there, but the way the method has worked here, you're only accounting for amino acids that are absorbed in the, tr in the pure form. All right, thank you. Our next talk is by Yoon Suk Jin. It's entitled, Use of an Oral Glycerol Drink Combined with Isotopomer Analysis to Understand Hepatic Metabolism. 
All right, thank you for this opportunity to present my data here. And today I'm going to talk about carbon-13 labeled glycerol to study liver metabolism. And the liver uh, is the major gluconeogenic organs in our body. Uh, when our blood glucose level declines on the a fast, the liver makes a new glucose through gluconeogenesis. And there are many uh, gluconeogenic substrate. The major one is uh, lactate and pyruvate and some amino acids, also gluconeogenic sub substrate. Uh, glycerol is also the gluconeogenic you know, substrate. When triglyceride, the fat in our body hydrolyzes, it produces uh, fatty acids and glycerol. The glycerol in our body uh, are most utilized by the liver because the liver uh, has very high contents of glycerol uh, kinase, uh, becoming glycerol 3 phosphate. When this glycerol 3 phosphate converted to these two triosis, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, uh, anyway, th these two are in very rapid exchange. The condensation of these two, two triosis make you know, glucose. And I study liver metabolism using the stable isotopes and NMR. When liver is exposed, the labeled glycerol, for example, the uniform labeled glycerol, uh, I expected to see one, two, three, and four, five, six labeled glucose the, from the liver. So when you look at the glucose using carbon-13 NMR, I expected to see this kind of spectrum. Uh, here's the carbon-13 of, of glucose having one, two, three, and four, five, six labeled glucose. Uh, it's precisely glucose derivative, but I just call it glu glucose. And uh, we are looking at glucose C2 and C5 positions. Uh, in both area, you see the singlet. This is coming from uh, glucose C2 labeled as carbon C2 labeled glucose and carbon the five position labeled the glucose. So in our body, we have a 1% natural abundance carbon-13. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the singlets that much. But if you see here in both area, we can see quartets here. In C2 region, the quartet signal coming from 1, 2, 3 glucose. This is C2, the carbon coupled with the C1 and C3 uh, at the same time. So it gives a quartet signal here. And similarly, uh, you see cardiac signal in C5 from the 4, 5, 6 labeled glucose. Uh, in this case, one peak from cardiac is overlapped with uh, the singlet, so that's why you see only three the obvious peaks from here. Uh, anyway, this is what I expected uh, if I think the liver is exposed with the labeled glycerol. <coughs> and however, it looks different. The actual spectrum uh, looks different from pre previous one. Uh, but we are not that bad. As you see here, C2, C5, we see large peaks from cortex in both in positions coming from 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6 glucose as we expected. Uh, however, we also see a bunch of doublets, 1, 2 labeled glucose, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5, 6 labeled glucose. Uh, how come we have a double labeled glucose you know, after treating the triple uniformly labeled glycerol. Uh, this can be explained by the labeled glycerol, uh, the metabolism through the TCA cycle prior to gluconeogenesis. So labeled glycerol, you know, become this triosis. Uh, when this triosis, this triosis, instead of going to the gluconeogenesis, it may undergo glycolysis, becoming labeled pyruvate. Uh, so far, the labeling pattern from glycerol to pyruvate, it does not change their older the triosis. Uh, however, when pyruvate enters the TCA cycle, the labeling pattern will be changed. Uh, pyruvate enters the, the TCA cycle through carboxylation and becoming oxaloacetate, and also it can enter the TCA cycle after losing one carbon uh, through acetic core enzymes through py pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, after entering the TCA cycle, the labeled TCA cycle cycle intermediate, the labeling pattern will be extensively, you know, scrambled. And the one of them, the intermediate of TCA cycle is oxaloacetate. This labeled oxaloacetate 
can exit the TCA cycle uh, through PEPCK, phosphorinol pyruvate carboxykinase. And this PP trios, the major labeling pattern in this case, is double labeled one after you know, scrambling the, the carbon 13 labeling. And the 2 3 is the major one, a little bit 1 2 will be produced. When this trios again participate in gluconeogenesis, the 2, two, two 3 trios become 5 6 glucose or 1 2 glucose. In the case of 1 2 labeled one, it will become 4 5 or 2 3 labeled glucose. So now we can explain how can we have you know, double labeled glucose isotopomers after treatment uniformly labeled glycerol. Uh, but here, we still have uh, one more question by looking at this. And actually, I was uh, really shocked when I first noticed double A12 and double A56, they are so different in here. Uh, because these two originated from the, the common source, I expected a similar peak size, similar the concentration of 12 and 56 glucose, but they, are, they were not the same. And after thinking, the other pathways, uh, I thought that the Pentose phosphate, pentose phosphate pathway activity explains uh, the difference. Uh, here again, the glycerol direct incorporation to gluconeogenesis will be produced 1, 2, 3, or 4, 5, 6 labeled the hexose. If these two isotopomers enter the, this pentose phosphate, phosphate pathway, uh, if you're gonna use the labeled, in the case of this one, it's gonna use the carbon one, it was labeled, in this case, is gonna use the carbon one, but this is not labeled. So they become one, two labeled pentose, or three, four, five labeled pentose. This, this pentose will be scrambled, the carbons will be you know, rearranged through non oxidative phase of pentose phosphate pathways, and it's gonna produce again the, hex, the hexose. In this case, one, two glucose, you know, precisely fractal six phosphate will be produced from one, two, three the hexos. Uh, here, in the case of 456, the labeling pattern does not you know, change. Uh, it will be the same labeling pattern. So uh, when the gluconeogenesis interrupted by this uh, pentose pathway, pathway the, it's going to produce additional 1, 2 glucose. Uh, that's why uh, this 1, 2 glucose and 5, 6 glucose, uh, they are you know, different. So by looking at this uh, carbon-13 labeling in glucose after labeled uh, glycerol treatment, uh, we can get quite uh, important information about the liver metaboli metabolism. Uh, obviously, you know, glycerol metabolism uh, to, to make uh, incorporation to glucose. And we can measure direct incorporation or indirect incorporation through the TCA cycle. Uh, the indirect contribution is uh, important. It's because TCA cycle exists in mitochondria. So uh, this uh, double labeled one informs the mitochondrial biosynthetic the functions. Uh, of course, the, using this difference, the pentose pathway pathway also can be estimated. And this pathway produces NADPH and the pentose. Uh, these two major products are important. The pentose, uh, of course, is used for the nucleotide synthesis. Uh, also, NADPH is uh, the reducing equivalent needed for the reductive biosynthesis such as uh, lipogenesis, uh, the cholesterol synthesis, and it also used to make a reduced form of glutathione. Glutathione is the, it fights against the oxidative stress. Okay, that one is based on glucose analysis, but liver also make another important metabolite, a triglyceride. So here, the phosphorylated glycerol, glycerol 3 phosphate, instead of going nucleogenesis, it may participate in the fatty acid esterification, producing tri triglyceride. Uh, so when you see the triple labeled glycerol backbone in triglyceride, uh, it informs glycerol direct incorporation uh, to triglyceride. Okay, we can also expect it to now expect it to double label the glycerol backbones. So uh, now it's easy to understand this one. So this double labeled one, again, the glycerol experienced the TCA cycle prior to incorporation to triglyceride. Uh, this is the carbon-13 NMR of triglyceride focusing on glycerol backbones. 
uh, the right one is a glycerol backbone C1 and C3 positions. Here the doublet, this, this signal coming from a double labeled and triple labeled glycerol backbones. On the left one, it's a glycerol backbone C2. Here, in this region, we, we can distinguish double labeled one and triple labeled one. Again, this doublet reflects glycerol metabolism through the TCA cycle and triplet reflect the uh, direct incorporation to glycerol backbone. Uh, okay, so using this glycerol, we can get that kind of information about the liver metabolism. If you do this uh, experiment using animal mice models, it will be no problem. You can freeze clamp the liver and do the lipid extraction or isolate glucose and convert to the gl glucose for NMR analysis. However, if you apply this method to human study, uh, it's not easy to have uh, liver tissues from humans, but look, luckily, these two metabolite, glucose and triglyceride, uh, synthesized in the liver are released into the circulation. And so we can study the liver metabolism using the blood, tri triglyceride, and the glucose. And with the animal models, I studied the both uh, liver samples and blood samples, and the information is basically the same. So this glycerol mustard I originally studied using animal models, and I tested with several different animal models. And the method developed uh, in animal models, uh, I translated to the clinical uh, studies. And now this, I have a list here, the clinical studies that I have been involved. Uh, some of them are already published, and some of them are going on. Some of them are doing with a collaboration with the, the others. And here, Dr. Green, <laughs> and she also applied the, the uniform labeled glycerol method to study liver metabolism of girls with a polycystic ovarian syndrome. And actually, she combined the glycerol method and oral sugar tolerance test. And today, for the remaining time, I just briefly uh, show you some results that my study with the fatty liver the subject. And this one recently published. Okay, in this study, we recruited uh, obese volunteers and we measured their, their liver fat content using proton, the NMR of liver. Uh, here you are looking at two spectra uh, from two subjects. The left one is uh, from lean, uh, normal liver. Uh, this is a water signal, big signal you can see in both spectra. And here you see very small signal coming from triglyceride. And this person has a 1% liver fat, normal liver. The right spectrum, you see the huge peaks coming from triglyceride, and this person has a 14% liver fat. So based on this uh, liver fat content, we divided two groups, normal groups and fatty liver group, uh, who had more than 5% liver fat. And this table shows you the clinical and biochemical characteristics between two groups. Uh, BMI, age, gender, all these are the same. Even blood test result, there's no differences. Uh, however, the, the main difference, the only difference is uh, liver fat content. Uh, normal group, 2% average liver fat. High fatty liver group, they have 11% liver fat. So uh, these, uh, these actually, you know, patients with a fatty liver, but they are in a subcondi subclinical condition. And this is a study protocol. All the volunteers, they were overnight fasted. On the study day at 9.30, they drank water, uh, having the dissolved uh, uniform labeled glycerol. After that, we collected the blood at six time points, beginning 30 minutes up to four hours. And actually, there's one more tracer in this particular study. Here, as you see, we also gave a DTO. Maybe you are familiar with the DTO method introduced by Dr. Landau. Uh, using this DTO method, we can distinguish how many your blood glucose coming from glycogen or gluconeogenesis. Okay, so plasma sample prepared for lipid extraction and glucose was derivatized for NMR analysis. Uh, here's the first result based on uh, triglyceride, glycerol backbone C1 and C3. The left one is from normal the liver, the right one is from fatty liver. Uh, as you see, it's a doublet. This signal coming from this labeled glycerol backbone is uh, much lower, more diluted. So when you see the, this graph in the middle bottom here, 
The open circle is from normal uh, river. The dark black circle is from the fairy river. The enrichment is uh, lower in fairy river group. Uh, when I, it, it's the percentage. When I calculated the absolute concentration of triglyceride uh, with uh, extra no, excess carbon-13 enrichment, the, in, the, the concentration um, is the same between two groups. So this means the fairy liver group, they diluted the tracer diluted more because they have a, a larger triglyceride pool size in their body. Okay, this data is based on glycerol backbone C2 analysis. Here we are comparing the doublet and triplet signals. Doublet signal informing a glycerol metabolism through the TCA cycle, triplet direct incorporation. When you compare the relative size, this doublet is much bigger in fatty liver group. So here, this graph shows uh, the percentage of indirect contribution to uh, gly glycerol backbone of triglyceride. Throughout the time points, the fatty liver group always higher the enrichment. This is the absolute concentration of triglyceride with uh, uh, two labeled, double labeled triglyceride backbone. Uh, not much differences, but trends are different. Uh, especially if you see the Tmax, the time for maximum concentration uh, is a 125 minute for fatty liver group and 190 minute for normal liver uh, group. So this graph tells you the more fraction of labeled glycerol experienced to the TCA cycle uh, in fatty liver group, and this process is uh, quicker in fatty liver group. Now the data based on glucose analysis, the carbon-13 enrichment in glucose is uh, lower in fatty liver group uh, at the beginning, at 30 minutes and 60 minutes time points. Uh, this is the absolute concentration of carbon-13 labeled glucose not statistically significant, but still there's a trend. At early time points, fatty liver group has a low concentration. Okay, five, six labeled glucose production uh, informing glucose, glycerol metabolism through the TCA cycle prior to gluconeogenesis. Uh, there's no statistical significance, but when you see here after uh, 60 minutes, the average value is uh, higher in fatty liver group. And actually, at the time point of 120 minutes, this concentration is higher in fatty liver group. So the fatty liver group more you know, glycerol experience the TCA cycle before the gluconeogenesis. Uh, the ratio 5-6 over 4-5-6 in glucose informing indirect contributions through TCA cycle over direct contribution. Not statistically significant, but the average value is always higher in fatty liver group. The 1-2 glucose production, uh, production uh, through the only pentose pathway pathway. Again, not significantly different, different but there's a trend. Fairy liver group has more 1-2 uh, glucose production. Uh, in animal model, the fairy liver animal actually had a higher the pentose pathway pathway activities, and they have a higher lipogenesis. So we can, based on this, maybe NADPH from the pentose pathway 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 used for lipogenesis. Okay, the last the animal spectrum of my talk, and this one it looked different. It's not anymore carbon-13 NMR. Now we are looking at the deuterium, the NMR. We are looking at deuterium attached to glucose. Uh, when liver produces uh, you know, glucose, uh, glucose in the presence of D2 in your body, uh, it's going to label as specific positions of glucose depending on its source, its sources. Uh, when glycogen and gluconeogenesis both uh, produce glucose, both of them will label H2 position right here. Uh, that's why the H2 peak is uh, the biggest peak here. If the glucose coming from gluconeogenesis, it's going to label H5 here. In gluconeogenesis, if it's originated from the TCA cycle, not glycerol, from the TCA cycle, it's going to label only H6 position. So based on the peak area, H2, H5, and H6, uh, we can calculate relative contributions uh, from glycogen, glycerol, and the TCA cycle. And when I measured those contributions, at each time point, there's no differences at all between uh, normal liver and fatty liver. 
Uh, this graph, left one is from normal liver, the right one is the fatty liver. However, when you see the two graphs, uh, you see some differences here. Uh, from the normal liver, uh, this is a glycerol contribution, glycogen contribution, and TCA cycle contribution. Uh, after glycerol load, the contribution from glycerol is increasing right here. At, at six, the time for 60 minutes, it, it, it reaches the maximum. After that, it declines. Uh, the same thing happened in fatty liver group. However, the process is much slower in fatty liver group. Another thing that I thought interesting is the glycogen contribution. Uh, as a glycerol contribution increases, glycogen contribution decreases. As a glycerol contribution declines, glycogen contribution increases. It's the same trend right here in fatty liver group. Uh, however, the TCA cycle contribution did not change throughout the, the study the period. So when glycerol contribution are changed, the glycogen, glycogenolysis will respond accordingly. So the conclusion of this study is fatty liver patients, uh, they have a low carbon-13 enrichment in the glycerol backbone of triglyceride. Uh, they also have a higher glycerol metabolism through the TCA cycle and they had delayed gluconeogenesis from glycerol. Also, they are less flexible in adjusting, supporting fluxes of glucose production after an oral glycerol load. Okay. Uh, Dr. Molloy cannot make he, this meeting, but he is very supportive of my studies. Uh, Rebecca prepared the samples, and here the bunch of nurses are involved in this study. And thank you for your attention. Paper is now open for questions. I have one. Um, so, is there just more flux down glycolysis and gluconeogenesis in the patients with fatty liver that's increasing the dilution? That's a, it seems to be your conclusion. It should have a glycolysis also. The pen the TCA cycle must be more active in the fatty liver. And it is no, the fatty liver, they have, uh, some people reported the higher flux through the TCA, mm -hmm. TCA cycle. I think that they, have, they contributed a high, higher contribution through the, the indirect you know, pathways. And you didn't measure hepatic glucose production when you were doing this, right? Uh, not, not the absolute you know, yeah. turnover. Yeah. I didn't measure it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Bob. Uh, yes, I agree. There's a you know, cycling. I think the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis can occur at the same time. They can contribute to the the some contribute to some errors in my the, the analysis uh, there. But we precisely did not measure the the cycling in their pathways. Yeah, but one of them shows you know the. The indirect contribution gradually actually increasing the over time. I think that's related to the cycling, the cycling because it's recycled you know, through the system. It contributed the gradual increase right there. But mm -hmm. we did not measure, you know, how much of it is actually cycled or how many, how much is the, you know, another the question. flux. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yes. Uh, I didn't catch this, but if you administer uh, uh, label glycerol, 
to uh, say a normal resting uh, uh, person, what percentage of the glucose comes directly from uh, gluconeogenesis? What part is, what percentage has gone through uh, other, other pathways? How, what is the contribution of the direct from glycerol to glucose directly? What percent do you think? Uh, that's uh, the deuterium enamel. I answers their questions. Glycerol contribution is actually lower compared to glycogen or TCA cycle contribution. Usually it's between 10 to 20 percent contributions. The direct is 10 to is that, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. The glycerol contribution to glucose production is uh, roughly 10 to 20 percent. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next talk is by Cecilia Dinitzpin from the University of Colorado entitled Oral Glucose Tolerance Tests with Tracers um, to Different Patient Populations. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to talk about this work. This is the first time we're talking about this. Um, so I hope that you find it interesting. So, so we're focusing today on trying to understand lipolysis. And lipolysis is the breakdown of these stored triglycerides to be used. Um, closer. All right, sorry, is that better? Yeah, okay. So lipolysis describing the breakdown of stored triglycerides in adipose tissue. Um, and as we know, lipolysis depends on the availability of exogenous glucose. So when you're in the fasted state, there's not a lot of exogenous glucose around. There are higher rates of lipolysis. And then in the fed state, when a lot of that exogenous glucose is available, um, there is insulin-mediated suppression of lipolysis. And insulin resistance of adipose tissue can make that suppression of lipolysis that's happening in the fed state either slow or incomplete. And this is a really important uh, aspect to study because it's thought that adipose insulin resistance contributes to other in insulin resistance in other tissues um, due to this increased circulation of free fatty acids and therefore is very involved um, in the etiology of the disease. So it's known that glucose insulin dynamics are different in adolescents, and adolescents is the patient population that we're really focusing on today. Uh, this shows some, some recently published data from the RISE Consortium, where here the, the levels of glucose are the same. Am I doing this properly? Okay, there we go. So the levels of glucose um, are, are pretty similar here across this oral glucose tolerance test, but you see this elevated levels of C-peptide and insulin um, in the, the teens here compared to, in red compared to the adults in blue. And that high level of insulin particularly is associated both with insulin resistance that's associated with puberty as well as this ability um, of, of these participants to produce such high levels of insulin. So you see much higher uh, insulin responses in adolescents than you typically would in adults. And it's known that this insulin resistance is also present in the adipose tissue in adolescents. So here we're kind of bringing together some data from a couple different CLAMP experiments, um, but they, they show that at these different levels of the CLAMP, um, we have this nice suppression in the adults in blue, 
and that suppression is, is much slower, so we need higher doses to get suppression in youth, and we're still not kind of getting down to these low levels that you see in adults. So the goal of the work that we're focusing on today is to develop the methodology to assess adipose insulin sensitivity using data from an oral glucose tolerance test. And we know there are many advantageous aspects of the clamp, but with the oral glucose tolerance test, we have a more physiologic measure, and a lot of the disorders of lipolysis are really manifested postprandially. So it's important to be able to understand what's happening um, in this kind of setting. And in particular today, we're going to focus on how the dynamics of glycerol following the OGTT reflect features of insulin-mediated suppression of lipolysis. So why are we focusing on glycerol? Well, as we've already talked about today, um, during lipolysis, our triglyceride here is broken down where this glycerol backbone is uh, separated from these three individual fatty acid chains and released into the bloodstream. But glycerol has some advantages as a marker of lipolysis compared to the free fatty acids. So first of all, um, as, as summarized here in this nice figure from Dr. Wolf's book, uh, free fatty acids are subject to both intracellular and extracellular recycling. And so this makes it difficult when you're, when you're looking strictly at free fatty acids to know what's actually describing lipolysis. In addition, there's some work from Dr. Parks's lab showing that insulin can promote free fatty acid uptake in the periphery. So here, if we're trying to pull apart the different effects of insulin, we have sort of multiple effects of insulin both on the suppression um, of lipolysis as well as promoting this uptake in the periphery if we look at free fatty acids. So we're focusing on glycerol. The participants in our, in our study are adolescent girls, all at Tanner stage five, uh, with a BMI greater than the 90th percentile and sedentary activity. We excluded participants with type two diabetes or any medications that affect insulin sensitivity. And the data I'm presenting are all collected as part of a cross-sectional trial. So the study design here was that one day prior to admission, the participants had an isocaloric diet. They refrained from physical activity, and then they were admitted. We ensured that they had that overnight fast, and then they had um, this primed constant IV infusion of glycerol starting at 6 a.m., then at 8 a.m., so after two hours, we had them ingest this um, 75 grams of glucola and then did regular blood sampling. And this is just a summary of the protocol showing that, glu that glycerol infusion starting at 6 a.m., then um, the, the drink at 8 a.m., and then the frequent sampling here. I'm showing it out to six hours. We actually started with four hours. Um, and then realized that we need to extend to six hours. So, so most of the data I'm presenting will show you for the first four hours, since we have that for all participants. So in our tracer calculations, all of our enrichments were determined uh, using GCMS spec. Um, we corrected for background enrichments, and then we used these, in these enrichments to look at the rate of appearance using Steele's non-steady state equation, which we've already heard about a bit today. It's, it's been used already to look at glycerol RA and clamps, and we wanted to think about it um, here in the dynamic setting of the OGTT. So now I'm getting to the mathematical modeling um, side of the talk and how we're doing this, and I wanted to start just by reminding you of, of some of the class of models that we're gonna be talking about today, here focusing on the oral minimal model for glucose. So the, the oral minimal model for glucose is a one compartment model where we think about the glucose dynamics here as this balance between a rate of appearance where contributions are coming from the ingestion of the drink as well as uh, basal um, endogenous glucose production. And then we have um, disappearance here due to uptake by the liver and the periphery. And so the equations describe the glucose concentration with both the insulin-independent and insulin-dependent glucose uptake, this basal uh, glucose release, and then the rate of appearance coming from the meal. Then the insulin action term here is given by X and is driven um, by our insulin concentration, which in this case is just our measured insulin concentration. 
And using this model, uh, we can compute an estimate of insulin sensitivity as the ratio of these two parameters, the P3 and the P2, that are involved in the dynamics of insulin action. Uh, this idea has also been used to develop mathematical models for free fatty acids, um, mainly in the setting of the IVGTT. Um, so here, Boston and colleagues described free fatty acid concentrations, remote glucose, and plasma glucose together using a delay differential equation approach. And then Parawal and colleagues described glucose, insulin, and free fatty acids using a differential equations compartmental model approach um, more similar to the minimal model and what I'll be presenting today for glycerol. In their approach, they explored several different forms of an insulin-dependent rate of lipolysis. So that would be this L of X term, where X, again, is insulin action. So we have the insulin-dependent rate of lipolysis, and then um, just this proportional uptake of uh, free fatty acids. So the model that we're developing for glycerol um, is using the same sort of ideas. We have a one-compartment model. Um, where we're describing the glycerol in the plasma here. The rate of appearance is coming from lipolysis of the adipose tissue, and then the majority of uptake we're assuming is happening by the liver. And in this original model, we're only describing glycerol concentrations, and so here the action of insulin is actually implicit because as insulin suppression takes place, or insulin-mediated suppression takes place, that affects the RA, but we're not explicitly looking at insulin in this um, setting. So just to emphasize a few of the assumptions in this model, we're assuming that glycerol is in a homogeneous instantly mixing pool. We're assuming that it's re representing adipose lipolysis, so we know that some glycerol may originate from other sources, but we're not accounting for that. So we're using it as our marker of lipolysis. And we're assuming this concentration-dependent glycerol uptake, so this term. Um, we know that the majority of glycerol uptake is in the liver, but there are other tissues that may also be involved. And that could give different kinds of kinetics here than you can easily capture with a single exponential. So, so that's sort of a simplifying assumption of the model. Within the model, one of the important pieces here is this rate of appearance of glycerol. We assume that there's a is a piecewise linear function um, of this form, and then use this to capture that implicit insulin dependence, as I mentioned. Now, in determining what this rate of appearance should be, we have several different choices. Um, one of these is to estimate it directly. So if we just look at the form of the model here, um, if we fix the volume of distribution here, then this is an identifiable model for all of our parameters. and so we can just straight estimate the rate of appearance, or we can approximate it using Steele's non-steady state equation. And then we fit our parameters um, to our glycerol data. So here we're just doing a constrained optimization using built-in MATLAB functions. So we've already seen Steele's equation, Steele's non-steady state equation today, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about this. But um, I just want to emphasize, so when we do this in practice, we're just doing a numerical approximation of this derivative. In doing this, we uh, get this approximation from RA for one of our representative patients. Now, there are a few known limitations uh, for Steele's non-steady state equation for glucose, and many of those also translate to using it for glycerol. So one of the biggest ones is that the volume of the compartment changes in time. And for us, things are a little bit better for glycerol than glucose because we can at least assume that plasma is the main compartment that we're focused on. But it also assumes that we have this instantaneously mixing pool, which isn't true for glycerol. We also know that that numerical approximation um, could be, could, to give us the change in enrichment, um, may be something that our, our Steele's equation is sensitive to. So in, in best practices, you try to keep that, that change very slow, but this is something that's changing for us. And um, also, as I mentioned before, we're not accounting for potential multi-exponential washout kinetics, which also affect the assumptions of Steele's equation. So to compare some of the glycerol RAs that we get using these different techniques, um, here in red, I'm showing you that Steele's estimate that we got.
And then in blue, I'm showing you two different um, estimates that we're just getting from parameter fitting. On the left, we have a parameter fitting where we actually fit the fasting level. So we constrained this level to be the same as what we got with steels. And then we estimated the levels um, throughout the rest of the RA. And for the right-hand side in green here, we're just showing the only constraint is that the parameters be non-negative. And so then with that, you can see we're actually starting at a lower RA, and then um, we get this kind of curve. So just to compare the differences, we see sort of a range of different possibilities using these different techniques for modeling glycerol RA. Now when we use that RA to actually determine what the glycerol concentration looks like, we also get a couple different traces. So just using the steels uh, calculation for RA, then we get this blue trace, and the red shows you the measured glycerol concentrations. And so you can see that they're recovering, and this isn't captured by the model because it didn't have that recovery in steels. When we use um, the RA that's largely estimated but is constrained at the beginning, we improve the fit, and here now we also see the recovery. And then if we just allow uh, the best possible RA, then we get uh, in terms of the estimation, then we also get the best possible fit to the model. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be using this form of the model actually to describe different kinds of, of glycerol traces. So this is the participant that we've been focusing on, and here you can see that this uh, participant has extended insulin secretion, sort of uh, indicative of prediabetes. Here is another participant uh, who did not recover uh, lipopolysis or their, their glycerol concentrations uh, within the four-hour time period and have this very elevated insulin response uh, similar um, or indicative of an insulin-resistant adolescent. And then here's a participant where we see uh, there's a recovery here. But within the insulin, we can see this two-phase insulin response suggesting that we had the insufficient um, initial insulin release. So from these glycerol time traces, we wanted to try to pull what features we could use to um, understand what's happening in terms of, of adipose insulin resistance. And the main questions that we wanted to look at or the main features that we were focusing on are how quickly does lipolysis suppress, how much does it suppress, when does it recover, and what's the impact of insulin dynamics. And so here, um, the metrics that we wanted to compare this to are several published measures um, of ways of determining adipose insulin resistance, so things looking at fasting free fatty acids times fasting insulin, fasting uh, glycerol RA times fasting insulin, and fasting glycerol times fasting insulin, and then a whole body insulin sensitivity measure that's computed with that oral minimal model that I showed you before for glucose um, here implemented, or the oral minimal model in general here implemented over four hours um, in SAM2. And so first we looked at our adipose insulin resistance measures. You would expect that if we have whole body insulin resistance, that would be um, potentially correlated with adipose insulin resistance. And we found that this was true for our fasting free fatty acid times fasting insulin metric, but not for our other metrics um, in, in this case. So then looking at the different features of our glycerol trace, we have how quickly does lipolysis suppress? So here we looked at the area above the curve here from the zero to 90 minutes, so during that initial time when we would expect suppression. We also looked at the time of 90% suppression, so whenever this 90% line would hit, the 95% suppression, and the percent suppression at time t equals 50. So for all of those measures, we found um, that there were no associations with either the adipo IR metrics or for the whole body insulin sensitivity. We did see an association between glycerol um, area over the curve and the average fasting glycerol. And this indicates that if we have higher rates of lipolysis initially in the fasted state, 
then this is somehow associated with faster and or um, more extreme suppression. To look at metrics of how much lipolysis suppresses, we had the maximum percent suppression um, for, for the individual and the glucose concentration at that point. Again, these measures were not associated um, with our measures for adipo-IR or whole body insulin sensitivity, but uh, we again saw this, this association between the maximum absolute suppression and uh, fasting glycerol. So again, indicating that uh, higher rates of lipolysis initially give us, in some sense, more suppression. So then we looked at when lipolysis recovers, and to quantify this, we looked at the absolute suppression at T equals 200 and at 240, and the percent suppression at those times. And here we found that both the absolute and the relative glycerol suppression at T equals 200 were associated with the whole body insulin sensitivity. And um, this tells us our, our greater suppression is associated with the lower SI in our, in our correlation here. So suggesting that these dynamics of glycerol recovery really relate to insulin sensitivity. And if glycerol is not recovering, then we have lower insulin sensitivity. So to conclude here, our current model accurately describes glycerol dynamics and gives us the smooth curve for glycerol concentrations. Um, over broad patterns of insulin secretion that we observe across individuals. Um, our preliminary results suggest that it's really the dynamics of recovery for glycerol that are most strongly associated with a whole body glucose insulin sensitivity. And future work here will focus on explicitly including insulin in these models and ideally eventually getting to the point where we have um, from our explicit in insulin uh, representation, a way of estimating adipose insulin sensitivity analogous to the whole body insulin sensitivity. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work. So my student Kate Bubar is a very talented undergraduate um, who was involved in a lot of this analysis. My PhD student Kai Bartlett uh, has done all of our glucose insulin sensitivity measures and then um, my collaborators, Dr. Creed Green, and um, our other collaborators at, at University of Colorado Denver in Anschutz. Thank you. I'm Bob Hickner, Florida State. It seems your point about the high initial glycerol concentrations being related to the greater suppression but that would probably relate or depend on who you're studying at the time, because if you have obese populations or well-trained populations, you might see something different than a sedentary lean or, or lean otherwise group. Can you comment on that? Sure, yeah, I, I think some of these things could definitely be different across populations. And as I said here, we're focusing on obese adolescents. Um, I think Getting, getting a better perspective on that could also come in if we have included the insulin so that we have the insulin explicitly present in the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on another point, I appreciated your statement that the glycerol could recycle, be taken up into muscle and other tissues, and the amount of that uptake and, and the relation to the VLDL, for instance, and other modes of action of getting um, well, having glycerol in or out, you would have a situation where during, say, hyperinsulinemia, that factor might change differently in different populations, uh, so following food intake. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities for potential error in the model based on the relative contributions of where the glycerol is, is going other than just the the hepatic removal of glycerol. Right, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that that really shows us, you know, those kinds of aspects of the physiology are things that are really make it problematic to try to say you steal is non-steady state. And that's why using a more flexible form can, can actually address that. 
better because it's not making a specific assumption of that. But again, you know, to, to fully account for that, we may need to bring in multi-compartmental approaches, other kinds of, of complexity to the modeling approach. Mm -hmm. So now that I have a third one. It's the, the no one brought up the, or no one that's that up, and asked about this uh, little blip in the beginning, in the first 50 minutes, you have a biphasic almost uh, in the steel model. Or can you comment on why that little blip is there, you think? Um, uh, yeah, so that, that was, was just for one individual. Um, so, you know, I, this wasn't something that we consistently saw over everybody, but um, I think, again, we know that there are some of these limitations um, associated with steel, and some of them people have, have addressed in different ways. So one of the ways is to sort of downsample and actually estimate your RA with fewer time points. Um, and so that's one thing that you could possibly do that would sort of smooth out some of the variability that you see in the RA there. Yeah, I'm caution smoothing out if it might be something real. But that's true. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, right, it's, it's, oh, it's a balance. <laughs> Because these girls are obese, it, it, um, and they may have some delayed gastric emptying. It could be delayed gastric emptying in that individual. She showed the insulin trace, and they had a very, uh, they had a small peak in insulin, came back down, and then went up to a large hump. And and that's why, um, yeah, that's why it may be that this model really needs the. Um, the explicit insulin rather than the implicit insulin, and that that would then explain those bumps. I'm not sure why the, where the cholesterol is taken up makes a difference. If you're modeling RA, so what difference does it make where it's taken up? So the the place that it's coming in in terms of where it's being taken up is in the assumption about the glucose decay, or the glycerol decay. So there, if we assume that it's just this single exponential, then that's assuming either one main place that it's being taken up or similar kinetics in the, in the way that it's being taken up across the board. And there's a compensation between the SG and the RA in, in actually describing glycerol concentrations. So I think it, it impacts what happens with your RA, not so, so um, for, for the overall model, it's impacting what's happening in RA because you have that, that potential interaction between parameters. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes our session. If you did get an evaluation form, we'd love it if you filled it out and turned it in. Thank you.